Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's good to see you all here today. Good to be here. Let's pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, as we come before you this morning, we know that we are not as we should be. That our hearts and our minds, because we were born with a sinful nature, because we walk around in a sinful world, that, Lord, we are affected. We have no right to come before you in our imperfection, and yet you sent your son Jesus to die for us so that we might have a relationship with you, that our sins would be taken away, and that we might be able to have fellowship with you. And Lord, I'm certainly grateful for that this morning. And for those that you have saved, those that you've called to yourself out of the darkness into your marvelous light, Lord, we thank you for who you are, for the example that you are, for the love that you show in spite of all our shortcomings, that you love us still. You know the depths of our heart, Lord. You know just how far the, the dark goes inside of us and you still love us and you've made a commitment to be with us until the end i thank you for that lord as we open your word today i pray that you'd be with me that i'd be clear i pray that you'd be with us that we might hear your voice speaking to our hearts that we might understand what it is that you would have us to do that would be clear and that we might be changed so lord we give you this time and we give you ourselves as your servants in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're back in the book of Mark. At least I believe we are. <laughs> it's funny, we had such a struggle with technology this morning, and it was like at the last moment we were able to pull it up. Thank you, Rocco, for that. Appreciate it. Um, we were able to actually have worship and have sound, which is an amazing thing. Well, last week we looked at the book of Mark, opening it up, uh, the first of the four Gospels, actually, that were written. After 400 silent years, God finally speaks to his people uh, from the time that Malachi speaks, uh, the closing of the Old Testament, the last prophet. There's 400 silent years before John the Baptist, or John the Baptizer, is actually announced. And so, as we were looking through chapter one, we looked at some of the background, it Mark sees Jesus as a suffering, sacrificial servant. And uh, one of the words that's actually used as a minister or as an assistant or a worker in the ministry is, I, I knew I was going to do this. It's an under rower. It's the Greek word which you see up there, which I can't help but to pronounce it like I'm Spanish. Who brought these? It just sounds Spanish to me. A huparatis. A huparatis is an under rower, one who goes, if you, if you remember Ben-Hur or any of those, you, you get to see what it is to be underneath the ship. You're not on top. You're not one of the commanders. You're underneath doing the rowing. And this is how Mark sees Jesus as an under rower, as a servant, uh, like an ox would be, just a, a beast of burden that just constantly keeps working and going. And that's his perspective all the way through. And we, we know that it's, it's somewhere between 50 and 65 it was written. Uh, we know that it's from Rome. Peter actually gives Mark all of this information as he writes it. It only has 16 chapters, so maybe we'll get through it this year. And it focuses on what Jesus did as opposed to what he said or what he taught or his miracles. Uh, John only pulls seven out in his gospel, but it focuses on what Jesus did. And you'll see all of the language. You'll notice Greek, Roman, and even Latin jargon through here. Uh, the, the things that they're called like Boanerges. And as we go through, I'll highlight them to show you that Mark is writing, or John Mark is writing from a very Roman point of view. The other Gospels, we see that Matthew was written to the Jews because what Jesus fulfilled was always mentioned throughout the book of Matthew. More Old Testament, 99 citations in the New Testament book of Matthew from the Old Testament. So he's very focused on Jesus being the king of the Jews, the Messiah who came. 
Mark is from a Roman point of view. It's about what Jesus did, and you'll see 1,337 examples of, he says, now or immediately, and then, and it's a very fast-paced book. I get tired when I read through it. What about you? It's like Jesus did this, and then he did this, and then he did that, and he did the other thing. It's like, oh my goodness, slow down here. And then you have Luke, who writes from a Greek point of view. It's about what Jesus said. It's his all of his personality that goes through there, a big thing on uh, how, how Greeks aren't bad, centurions aren't bad. It's the gospel of women. If there's a story about a woman, it's probably in the book of Luke. So all of that focuses on the humanity of Jesus. And the book of John really was written to the church. And it's a focus on the deity of Jesus Christ. You'll see it in the way it starts. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God speaking of Jesus and his deity. So all four of these have a very distinct flavor, much like you would have four different writers that would write the same exact story from four different points of view. We talked about this last time. We see beginning in verse one, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the son of God, as it is written to the prophets, behold, I send a messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord and make his path straight you'll notice that Matthew and Luke begin with the genealogy of Jesus from his mother and from his father. One, his father, who's not really his father. We know it's his stepdad. But legally, for him to be a Jew, he would have to have that lineage through his stepdad. And then you have it through Mary as well. So both of them related to David, and it goes all the way back. But a servant doesn't have a lineage, right? There's no need for a servant to have a lineage. And so he doesn't begin with that. He begins right with the road worker. Uh, at least that's what John calls himself. He says, prepare the way of the Lord and make straight paths for his feet. In other words, get your heart right because something's about to happen. God's about to pour out his spirit and he's about to bring the Messiah. So make sure you're ready for that. Nobody wants to be surprised, right? Can you imagine if the Lord came back right now? Right this second. See ya. I wouldn't be surprised right now, but maybe on Friday, I might be surprised and I wouldn't want to be in the middle of something silly. But John is saying, get your act together and get ready because he's coming. John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And then all the land of Judea and those in Jerusalem went out to him. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. This wasn't a brand new thing, but it was a twist on something that was familiar. Baptism would have to happen if you were non-Jew and you wanted to convert to Judaism. You'd have to learn the law. You'd have to learn the Old Testament and all that was there, especially the first five books of Moses. You'd have to get circumcised and then you would have to wash. Nobody else would be dunking you in. You would basically go and just wash and they would wash you and say, okay, that's good. You're washed. So this was a little bit different, and John was the one administrating this. And John came, and he was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist. And he ate locusts and wild honey. Any of you having lunch <laughs> with locusts and wild honey? You've seen a locust, right? There's a handful of them up there. Crunchy. From what I understand, um, they still, around the world, they still do it. I know in China they do it. Uh, Bill, I'm not sure if you've uh, partaken of the locust, but they will actually coat them with chocolate. They'll do all sorts of things. Typically, they pull the wings off and the, the legs off, and then you can mash it up, actually, and mix it with some flour and put it in a cake, put a little honey on it, and then slide it across the table to your kids and say, here, eat this. It's high in protein. But this is what he ate out in the wilderness. And there were some people that try to say that word locust is actually the locust bean, which is actually a bean that grows, but it doesn't grow anywhere in this area. So as much as you try to get around it, he ate locusts and honey. If you invited him over for dinner, that's his meal of preference. So veal parm would be right out. And I imagine he'd get it in his beard. And, you know, so I got all sorts of things in my head. He ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached saying, here comes the one after me who was mightier than I, whose sandal strap I'm not worthy to stoop down and loose. 
I indeed baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. John the Baptist was such a figure that the Pharisees came out and they said, well, who are you? Are you Elijah? Because he looked like Elijah. He's got, a, he's got a leather belt around his waist. He lives out in the wilderness. He eats locusts and honey. He's a wild man. He's, he's like a biker dude. Are you Elijah? No, I'm not Elijah. Are you the prophet? Because Moses prophesied of one that would come after me and him you'll listen to. Are you that one? And he said, no. And they said, well, are you the Messiah? He says, absolutely not. That guy, I don't even have the right to loosen his sandals. And the funny thing is, he says all of these things and he preaches a lot of hell and damnation and he's yelling at the Pharisees, you know, who warned you to, co to, to flee from the wrath to come? And he's all full of that until he sees Jesus and he baptizes Jesus. And after that, the only thing that we hear from him on sight is, there's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Amen. When he met Jesus, something happened to him. Something changed about his message and something changed about what his ministry was. And he's baptizing in the Jordan River and uh, looks a whole lot like Elijah. And immediately coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens parting and the spirit descending upon him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Immediately, the spirit drove him into the wilderness where he was in the wilderness for 40 days, tempted by Satan and was with the wild beasts and the angels ministered to him. We know that the other gospels actually explain much more, Matthew and Luke, about what happened in the synoptics, about how Jesus was tempted, the three ways he was tempted, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. All of that is, is brought out. Mark is just, just the facts. Just, he's doing a hit and run with all these little vignettes. Jesus went out as soon as he was baptized by John, and he had a different baptism than everybody else because it was essentially the beginning of his ministry. Like they would, they would uh, anoint somebody who was going into the priesthood with oil. Here, Jesus is being anointed and it begins his ministry. The first thing that happens is he's out into the wilderness to be tested. That's a heck of a way to come to the world, don't you think? I'm going to go save all these people who don't want anything to do with me, and yet he has to endure all the same temptation that you and I have to undergo, and yet without sin, to prove that he's, he's worthy. Now, after John was put in prison, this is a fast forward just to give you kind of an ending for John. After John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. This is about a year and a half later, we know, that this happens. And Jesus then begins to move through Galilee once John is put in prison. And it's rather interesting that we're told it's when John's ministry ends that Jesus' begins. Almost like you don't want any confusion. You can make of it what you will. And as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother. By the way, Simon is Peter's first name. Casting a net into the sea for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. And when he had gone a little further from there, he saw James, the son of Zebedee and John, his brother, who also were in a boat mending their nets and immediately called them. And they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and they went after him. I read this story and I go, my goodness, that seems like a rash decision. Jesus comes and he says, follow me. Okay. But see, Jesus had met them before. If you remember, he went and asked them, hey, have you got any? No, didn't get anything. All Well, throw the net on the other side of the boat and you'll have. And they do that. And Peter gets on his knees and he says, you got to leave me alone. I'm not the guy. But we see later he calls them and he says, it's time. I want you guys to come and follow me. And they do. I find it interesting that Peter, who is a man of action, as we know, and uh, he's the guy who's probably narrating all of this, he's the first disciple mentioned in Mark's gospel because I think he's the one dictating. He also happens to be the last guy mentioned in Mark's gospel because he's given the story. But uh, 
trivia. I'm sorry. I digress. But you see, Peter and John, what are they doing? They're fishing. They're throwing a, a net into the water because they're fishermen, we're told. What are, what are James and John doing? They're mending their nets. I find it interesting because you see, Peter and Andrew both had very active ministries and they were fishers of men. Peter was always going out. Andrew was always bringing people to Jesus. There were some Greeks that had a question and they wanted to ask Jesus and Andrew brought them. Remember when they didn't have any food and one of the disciples said to Jesus, Jesus, these people have been here and they've been following you for three days. They're going to start falling out. Send them away. Send them away so they can go get food. And Jesus said, you give them food. And somebody, you know, takes the abacus and says, well, you know, if we had this much money, everybody could have a bite maybe. And then there's Andrew. Andrew says, well, I grabbed this young kid and he's got his lunch up his sleeve. But uh, what is that among so many, he says. Andrew is always bringing people to Jesus. So they both had a, a fishing ministry and they were always active with the net bringing people in. And then I look at John and James and they had a different ministry, right? John, we know, is the apostle of love. He's the one who gives us all of this love one another. And, and he just goes on and on about it. And it's interesting how they have kind of the, the mending ministry and Peter and Andrew have the fishing ministry. And it was Jesus who said to, and, to Peter and Andrew, I'll make you fishers of men. I just thought it was interesting. A servant calls others and, re and responds. Because Jesus is seen as a minister, he's seen as this under rower. He is somebody who not only is going to be a leader and a, and a servant, but he's going to call other people to come and serve and to lead. And Jesus is a great example of doing both at the same time. And then they went to Capernaum. And immediately on the Sabbath, they entered the synagogue and they taught. So the first thing Jesus does is takes his new disciples to church. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. You know, when somebody knows something authoritatively, people listen, right? When somebody knows something authoritatively, they have knowledge and a conviction. People will listen to them. Now, you might not agree with them, but they'll listen to you if you have that. And Jesus taught as one having authority. I put the little scripture here, John chapter three, that Jesus, God did not give him a particular measure of the Holy Spirit, but without measure, Jesus had the spirit, Jesus had the spirit of God. He was able to do things. You and I have limitations. Or didn't you notice that? Did, did you not know that you have limitations? Um, you have limitations, I, I hate to tell you, but you do. We all do. Jesus had the spirit without measure. And so he was able to just go and do. And the more that I read, I say, my goodness, Jesus left us quite an example of how to be. And I'm not sure that I have enough spirit to do that. But I'm not sure that I'm as faithful as I should be with what he's already given me. So I think about his authority and how he spoke with this deep conviction to people and because he had the spirit without measure. A servant speaks on behalf of another with authority. I find that a servant speaks for somebody else, right? They don't speak for themselves. Trust me, it's true. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, therefore go and make disciples of every nation. Jesus said, all authority has been given unto me, therefore you go. And it's not just the 12, or that would be the end of the church. We'd have a first century church and that'd be it. Nobody else would say anything. And how are people going to know unless somebody sent? Amen. And unless somebody sent, they're not going to hear the word of God. So Jesus has authority and we speak on his authority when we say things according to the word of God. Amen. Amen. Now there was a man in the synagogue with an unclean spirit. And he cried out. Now, this is in the middle of like a church service. Could you imagine? Somebody pops up and screams out in the middle of a service. I thought for sure somebody might try. <laughs> now, there was a man in the synagogue with an unclean spirit. And he cried out saying, let us alone. Interesting, he says, us. What do we have to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? 
I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, be quiet. Uh, literally, in the original language, it's be muzzled. We would say, shut up. <laughs> be quiet and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out of him. And they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, what is this? What new doctrine is this? And with authority, he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. Jesus was taking charge, and he didn't want any distractions. He knew what he was called to do. And people were amazed. Can you imagine somebody yelling out and, and making a ruckus, and it's, you know, shut up and sit down and get out. And it happens. With the shriek, and suddenly the person's back in their right mind, not controlled by an evil spirit. And everybody just saw that happen. And like, what is this? This new doctrine. What? After 400 silent years of not hearing anything from God, a prophet not being called, there's John the Baptist who inaugurates the ministry of Jesus Christ. And we see his authority. A true servant does not avoid conflict. Notice how Jesus handled this thing head on. He didn't say, uh, could you get a couple of deacons to, to get this guy out of here? You know, uh, he didn't do that. He took charge and he made it happen. A servant does not avoid conflict. How many of you enjoy conflict? Just Jules, okay. Okay. Jules and Sean, you two guys are going to arm wrestle after the service, okay? We're going to see how you deal with that. Um, Anyway, a true servant does not avoid conflict. It's not something that anyone's really excited about dealing with, but you don't avoid it because you know inevitably avoiding it just makes it worse. It's like, hey, that little light went on in my car. That's right, ignore it. It'll go away, along with the rest of your car. And that's what ends up happening. But Jesus takes charge because a true servant doesn't avoid conflict. He runs to it and deals with it, as Jesus did. Verse 28, immediately his fame spread throughout the region around Galilee. Now, as soon as they had come out of the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew and James and with James and John. But Simon's wife's mother lay sick with a fever. That's his mother-in-law, by the way, for those of you who don't know that. And they told him about her at once. In other words, Jesus, we're going we're gonna to go to my house. Okay, great. They get to the house and the cook of the house is down. Oh, sorry, Jesus. We invited you home for lunch after church, but mom's not feeling well. And she's, it says in Luke that she was gripped with a fever. It was, she was gripped with a fever. And this is a doctor writing this. So he knew what he was talking about. And they told him about it at once. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. And immediately the fever left her and she served them. We saw this last week. Jesus shows up. She's not well. And what's he do? He takes care of it. You guys see something that needs to be done? Deal with it. Do it yourself. Why not? Is there somebody better fit to do something like that? Do you think Jesus said, oh, well, you really sorry. We'll come back later. See you later. There's this giant obstacle. I guess we're going to have to, you know, just avoid it and deal with it. You know, it's a good idea to bring Jesus home and not leave him at church. Don't you think? I think it's a great idea to bring Jesus home. Don't, don't leave him here. When you leave, don't forget what you've learned here. Don't forget that you've met with him. Don't forget that he's spoken to your heart, the things that he speaks. Bring him home with you. So I just thought that was a, a nice little... And sick on the Sabbath. Gee, and it's amazing how on Sunday... There are so many more problems than other days. Like today, we had such trouble with our audio, getting it up, and we didn't know what we were going to do until about 40 minutes before the service. It was an amazing thing to see everybody running around and all the different reactions and points of view. And it's amazing how the Lord came through and he made this thing happen. After we finally prayed, Sometimes you get to the point where your boat's sinking and you, then you go wake Jesus up. Jesus, 
we're drowning, don't you care? Like the disciples. And suddenly he stands and he says, that's it, be still. Be muzzled, it's the same term. And quiet. And suddenly it all went away and they go, who in the world is this guy? Even the wind and the waves obey him. It happens with us too. I don't know about you, but any of us who are involved in getting all of this together for you guys, we understand what it is to put all this together, all the various parts and pieces and all the things that can go wrong. From Sunday school to the, the kitchen to uh, the audio video, all of this. It's an amazing thing how God brings it all together and it's by his grace. Amen? Yes. Amen. I'm glad for that. Yeah, so sickness happens on the Sabbath. A servant serves even when it's inconvenient. You know, Jesus went, taught, he expended energy, I'm sure, because he was in a human body, although he was God himself. And so, I don't know about you, but after church, like sometimes I like to get a nap. What about you guys? Do you like to take a nap on Sunday? Randy's got his hand up. He's, he's standing in line. Get a, maybe something to eat. Sometimes I don't know whether I should eat or I should nap first. But here's Jesus, who's just called his disciples. They all went to synagogue. And so they heard the word of God. Jesus expended himself. He's casting out demons, getting a guy in his right mind, delivering him back to his family, maybe in a better shape. And now Peter says, come on, relax, come to my house. And except my mother-in-law's sick in bed and there's no food ready. You know, when you're a servant, those things don't matter. You know, I really wanted to take a nap. It's like Jesus' life is just go, go, go. And what does he do? He sees her in the grip of a fever, which means, you know, you're sweaty, you're hot. You, you don't have covers on. You might even be semi-conscious. And you're just laying there. I remember COVID, I think the first time. Uh, just disgusting. You just feel disgusting. You just sweat. You got this bone-crushing headache. And Jesus went over and touches her. I don't know if you've ever touched an older woman who's in the grip of a fever but most people don't like to touch other people that are in the middle of sweating their brains out. Jesus goes over and grabs her and he lifts her up. And guess what? No recuperation time. She's good. And she immediately begins to serve them because when Jesus touches you, Amen. that's what we should be doing, right? That's a natural reaction of somebody that's been freed of disease like that. So that's what happens to us. Even when it's inconvenient, a servant serves. The service of a sacrificial servant inspires others to serve. When you see other people serving, it has the tendency to make you say, well, what can I do? How can I help? How can I get, put me in the game, coach. You guys ever get that? You see people that are helping and pitching in and you want to pitch in. I get that way all the time. I have to be careful. I don't get too tied up. And I remember I have, oh, I have other things going on here I have to do. But Jesus serving was an example for her. And she jumps up to her feet and, and away she goes. They did it really, really well, I think, in The Chosen. If, if you've been going through that series, he walks in and he sits with her for a while and she's just kind of laying there sweating, uh, you know, a, an older woman in the grips of a fever. Somebody who's always probably been busy about the house, taking care of the needs of other people and is completely laid out. And Jesus takes her hand and she rises up and then she's busy about serving. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that I would do that if I, if I was at home and not anticipating a crowd and suddenly a whole crowd came for lunch. I'm not sure even if I was well, if I'd be good with that. But she is and she gets up and serves them. At evening, when the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were demon possessed. And the whole city was gathered together at the door. Imagine being Peter and saying, I'm so glad I invited Jesus to come home with me after synagogue. The whole city was gathered together at the door. Then he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he did not allow the demons to speak because they knew him. 
So after a busy day of calling disciples and going to synagogue and casting out a demon and then going to go have lunch and there's this woman who's sick with a fever and he raises her up, once they have a little something to eat, the Sabbath is now over. The sun is going down and now the people of God, the Jews, are able to move around freely because the Sabbath is over as soon as the, the last bit of sunlight disappears from over the, you know, the horizon. And everybody says, let's go see Jesus. And they bring the worst trouble and problems that they can. Demon-possessed people and diseases. By the way, there are two different categories. It's not just one category. Not everyone who is sick is demon-possessed. And not everyone who's demon-possessed is necessarily sick. They're two different categories. Uh, some people would lump them all into one. But we're not those people. And neither is the scripture. In Matthew 8, 17... Matthew gives us this background. He said of this very same event that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah, the prophet saying he himself bore our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. Matthew understands that Jesus is fulfilling the prophetic ministry that was spoken of him, that he would be taking away infirmities and diseases. A servant stays up late for the benefit of meeting the needs of others. Huparates. That's an under rower. A servant stays up late for the benefit of meeting the needs of others. A any of you value sleep? You know, I got a schedule, and if I'm not in bed by 10.58, I'm going to be unhappy. Honey, can you put the garbage out? I just took my shoes off. <laughs> if you're a true servant, it doesn't matter. If you're a real servant, then it doesn't matter if you have to stay up late. Or if you get a phone call at 2 o'clock in the morning. It doesn't matter that somebody else needs you to do something. I, I can't tell you how important this is. A servant really has no life of their own. Because you belong to another, don't you? Who do you belong to? You belong to Jesus. And so whatever happens, it's just an appointment you weren't aware of. And I can tell you as a pastor, it happens all the time with me. And a lot of you people are very nice about it. You're like, oh, pastor, I hate to bother you, but I have a question. It's like, oh. Can't you see I'm busy here? And yet we get that way, don't we? Or maybe you, you've just finished your work day and it's one minute to five. And you're like, oh, oh, oh I'm out of here. And your boss says, hey, by the way, can you do me a favor? And of course you say, no. <laughs> do you see the time? Do you not care? Does the world revolve around you? Well, perhaps you don't. I, I've, I've thought things like that. Maybe I haven't said it. But you see, a real servant doesn't do that. A real se servant says, what do you, what do you need? You, you, you tell me jump, the only thing I want to know is how high. Because that living well that springs up into eternal life is inside of you, which is the spirit of God and the understanding of the scriptures and the example of Jesus Christ. And so that's what a servant does. A servant stays up late for the benefit of meeting the needs of others. You know, Jesus had to stay up all night because the whole city came. So how long do you think it took Jesus? You think he just said one prayer for everybody? Boom. All right, see you later. Those of you who are crippled, not crippled anymore. Those of you who are sick, not sick, used with demons. No, he probably took them one at a time, which means he's up all night. Huparates. It's my new, my new word. Now, in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and he departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. So Jesus not only had a very busy day, but he woke up while it was still dark in the morning, and he pulled away 
to spend time with his heavenly father. If Jesus, the son of God, did that, how important is it for you and I to do that? And yet sometimes my alarm goes off, I get up, my feet hit the floor, I go in the shower and I run off and I'm, I'm you know, work, 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 gotta go, gotta go, gotta go. I don't touch base. I don't remember who I am. I don't remember why I'm here. I don't remember. Sometimes in the middle of my morning, I go, oh, yeah, good morning. You guys ever do that? (laughs) Welcome to New Jersey. (laughs) Jesus, after being up all night ministering and pouring himself out for people, wakes up before the sun is up, and he gets alone with his heavenly father. What a great example. That's what a servant does. He gets at the feet of his father and say, Father, what would you have me do? What do you want me to do? My ear is inclined to you. Alone with God. I hope you can remember the last time you were alone with God. No radio, no TV, no newspaper, no reading. Alone with God. Quiet, isolated, no distractions. Do you know how important that is? And it's like our soul craves that. And yet it's the one thing that we just don't seem to get to. Away from everybody else. No distractions. That's a good place to be, to be with the Lord. A servant listens before speaking. A servant listens before speaking. If you... Have you ever been a type of person to give somebody an answer before they're done asking their question? Only fools do that. I'm guilty. Somebody's trying to formulate a question and I already know what the rest of it is, or at least I think I do. Are you patient enough to wait until they're done? Because it might be something you don't know. And that's called humility. Jesus is busy listening. Well, how do you know he's listening? Here's an Old Testament passage in Isaiah 50, verses 4 to 6. The Lord God has given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him who is weary. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to hear as the learned. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious, nor did I turn away. I gave my back to those who struck me, and my cheeks... To those who plucked out the beard, I did not hide my face from shame and spitting. Doesn't that sound like Jesus? The Lord God has given me the tongue of the learned that I should know how to speak a word in season to him who is weary. A good servant listens before speaking. And then you'll be able to use the right amount of words. So here's my challenge to you guys. Pick a time. Rest. Reflect and recharge. Rest. Reflect on the things of God and allow him to recharge you. Because we can become so about putting out some product We're so busy about doing. And we think we're doing it for the Lord. We think we have all the right motives. And pretty soon we find out that we're all by ourselves doing something that God never told us to do. Bearing burdens he never asked us to take on. Dealing with things that we are ill-equipped to handle. You guys know what I'm talking about? Okay, so I'm not the only one. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him. Peter wakes up, looks over at the bed where Jesus was. He's not there. Uh Uh-oh. Wake up without the Savior? That's a problem. Simon and those who were with him searched for him. And when they found him, they said to him, everyone is looking for you. But he said to them, let us go to the next towns that I may preach there also, because for this purpose I have come forth. And he was preaching in their synagogues throughout Galilee and casting out demons. Interesting. Jesus disappeared. Nobody knew where he was. Peter couldn't find him. Can you imagine? Jesus! 
It's a very common name. It's like saying Jesus, you know, in Mexico. <clears throat> it's a common name. And they're looking for Jesus and they're going, and I can imagine it's Peter. He goes, what are you doing? See, I would respond like, what do you mean, what am I doing? What are you doing? Everybody's looking for you. It's interesting, the draw of the crowd and how Peter was very reactive to that. Everybody's looking for you, Jesus. You got work to do. Come on. There's more people showing up at the house. I couldn't believe it, even after last night. <clears throat> didn't fix the whole town, apparently. I'm sure Jesus didn't say, I just wish it would stay fixed. But he said, listen, there are other things that need to be done. What you think is a priority and you think is an emergency isn't because it's not my priority. Learning to say no to things is hugely important. It will give you a great deal of freedom to say no to the things you're supposed to say no to. Say yes to those things the Lord's called you to do, but you've got to say no to other things that would steal from what the Lord would have you do. You guys know what I'm talking about? I used to be a contractor, and I would fall into the thing where a customer would say, oh, well, I need this done, and I need that done. Say, well, wait a minute, how, how, how much do you need that done? Do you really need that done? I ha you know, I have to put X amount of siding in your house because it's going to rain tomorrow? Oh, it's not going to rain tomorrow. Okay, well, then it can wait. Okay. Because, see, I have a date with my wife on Friday night, and that's my priority. I got a date with a hottie, you know I'm out of here. <laughs> and besides, investing in my marriage is much cheaper than investing in a divorce. <laughs> I see you know that's true. Priorities are hugely important. Knowing what the most important thing is and what the Lord would have you do helps you to say no to things, and no gives you all sorts of freedom. No is one of those things that will break you free from having to please other people as opposed to doing what the Lord would have you do. And so J Jesus says, yeah, I understand you think this is an emergency, but I got a priority. You see, I've been listening. And I know my father wants me to go to the other towns. Just because maybe it was Peter's hometown of Capernaum and it happens at his house. Maybe he's like, Jesus, I got our, I got our itinerary all planned out for the next week. Sorry, the Lord's told me to do other things. And that's completely okay to say no, isn't it? There are things we should say no to. If the Lord doesn't want you to do it, it doesn't matter how much people scream. The Lord's called me to do something else. And you're going to steal from that if you take care of that. Learning the difference is, is a lifelong thing. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 3, Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogue and in the streets, that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. You see, Jesus didn't tell his right hand where he was going or what he was doing. He kept it a secret and he had to be found. I like to do that. I think Jesus calls us to do lots of secret things where it's just between you and him because it's, uh, it's easy to do something publicly for the praise of other people or because you don't want the pressure of other people saying, do what the Lord would have you do and you'll have perfect peace. A servant resists recognition and status. A servant resists recognition, and status. Do you need to have the whole world speak well of you? Do you need to impress people with your knowledge? Do you need, what, what is it that you need? A servant doesn't look to be seen. A servant looks to go under the radar. Not, hey, look at me, look at me, what I'm doing, look what I'm doing. And you can smell it right? You can smell that. It's like a servant does not seek to be recognized. A servant resists being recognized and status. 
It's much more about a relationship with our Heavenly Father than it is what anybody else thinks. Amen? Amen. Now, another word, now. Now, a leper came to him and imploring him, kneeling down to him and saying to him, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus moved with compassion, stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. So apparently somebody got through the security wall of the disciples and found Jesus as well. A man who's a leper, who according to the law is not allowed to be with other people at least those who don't have leprosy. Leprosy is a very interesting disease. It affects the nervous system. It affects the extremities. And anywhere where there's fat, the tip of your nose, your ears, your fingertips, any of those areas where there's fat, it tends to infestate. It's, it's actually a bacterial infection. And it's 100% curable, by the way. They hit you with a, a, a whole series of antibiotics and it's knocked out. One of them actually, one of the ingredients is actually uh, aspirin. And yet there's still a problem in the world with it. Actually recently uh, in um, Florida, they had an outbreak of leprosy. And they're not sure where it came from. They, they've tracked it down to armadillos, but you know, who knows? I, I read too much, I'm sorry. But leprosy will affect you to the point where you'll get an infection and you won't feel it, like in the extremities, in your toes, in your feet, in your hands, um, or on your face, the extremities, like your ears, your nose, including the eyes. And there are lots of pictures online. I just showed you the most mundane pictures. And you end up with no fingers and no toes. And it, and it works its way back. It, the infection goes to the bone level and it actually erodes away at your bones as well once it gets far enough. So here's a person who comes up to Jesus who has leprosy and approaches Jesus and says, if you are willing, you can make me clean. I see a couple of things here. Number one, this person has faith that Jesus can do it. But the question is, are you willing? Don't you question the same thing when you pray and ask God? Lord, I know you can. But I'm not sure that I'm that important that you're willing. I always want to know and pray in God's will. And I know God can, but I'm not sure that he will. And that's where my faith goes shy. How about you? Lord, you can make me clean, but are you willing? Do you care? That's really the question, isn't it? And I, I, that's my question very often when I pray to God, Lord, I know you can, but are you willing? And Jesus tells him, I am willing. And I just find that so comforting to hear. And Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Leprosy is a bacterial infection. It incubates slowly. It actually happens underneath the skin in your bloodstream where you can't see it. It presents as numbness and skin eruptions as it infects the entire body. It is seriously contagious and curable. It's just like sin. Sin that you don't see and it gets underneath and then there's a numbness and there are certain things that don't bother you and you're okay doing them even though you know that they're not right. And eventually it leads to death. Just like leprosy does. And it's contagious because th there's no such thing as an innocent sin. There are always effects that radiate from our lives whether they're secret in our minds uh, or they're, they're behind closed doors it always affects us and it affects everyone else around us. Leprosy is the very picture of sin in the scriptures. In fact, the rabbis called it the finger of God. That if you had leprosy, it's because God was showing judgment on you, which Jesus corrects them later about. There were some famous 
lepers. Miriam, if you remember, was given leprosy because she overstepped her bounds and spoke against her brother. Naaman, who was a Syrian, he wasn't even a Jew, and was healed of his leprosy. And if you remember, Elijah's servant, who uh, wanted to make some money off of this, decided to get this guy's clothes and some of his stuff, and he caught leprosy from Naaman. And it, it followed his whole family line. And then this person, kind of strange in the scriptures, called Simon the leper. Simon was called Simon the leper, even though Jesus cured him of leprosy. And it says that he was completely restored, which means if, if, if you didn't have fingers, you got fingers again. If you were missing toes or your nose or your ears, that, and he restored them. And they always called him Simon the leper, even though he wasn't a leper anymore. You know, it's like calling somebody a biker, even though they're not a biker anymore. <laughs> but the, the name just stuck because Simon also is a popular name. So Simon the leper, very famous person in the scriptures who traveled with Jesus. A, leprosy, a, a leper comes up and says, if you're willing, and he says, be cleansed. A servant is not afraid to touch an unclean person. A servant is willing to stoop low and get dirty. Like Jesus washing the disciples' feet. That's what a servant does. It's not something you say, oh, leprosy. You know, God calls us to be a light to the nations. People that you maybe wouldn't be friends with. That maybe you don't want to associate with. And yet Jesus calls us to, to go and touch them. Like Jesus did. That's the love of our God. And you can do it. And you can overcome whatever stigma it is. And the thing is, what they have won't get off on you, but what you have will rub off on them. And that's the way it's supposed to be. And he strictly warned him, this last slide, he strictly warned him and sent him away at once and said to him, the guy who was just healed, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go your way, show yourself to the priests, and offer for your cleansing those things which Moses commanded as a testimony to them. However, he went out and began to proclaim it freely, and it spread the matter so that Jesus could no longer openly enter the city, but was outside in deserted places, and they came to him from every direction." You see, this guy was healed and he could not shut up. He had to tell everyone. And Jesus told him specifically, don't tell anyone. And this guy was not good at keeping this secret. And you might say, well, that's funny. Because, you know, when Jesus comes into your life, that's what you want to do. You want to tell everybody. In fact, when I first got saved, I, I told everybody, people I didn't even know, hey, you know about Jesus? I was, I had no wisdom. I had very little knowledge. But I know I was cleansed. Amen. And I wanted to tell the whole world. And I did it without wisdom, <laughs> without knowledge very often. I don't think Jesus doesn't want us to tell anybody. The thing is, He's done it to us and he tells us we should tell everybody and we don't tell people. Here, he tells them don't say anything and he tells everybody. It's like you got to use reverse psychology, I think, right? Hey, don't tell anybody you're saved. Let them go to hell. Really, don't, don't stop them. Now I'm stirred up. He tells them not to say anything because it ruins his ministry. Because now crowds of people, like have come to Peter's house, are now going to crowd him and stop him from doing what God's called him to do, ultimately, and change his whole ministry. So he says, don't tell anybody because it's going to be a big mess. Stardom will ruin a servant. Stardom. You know, being all that in a bag of chips, being, being somebody well sought after, somebody who's popular, somebody who's looked at, stardom will ruin a servant. And that's why Jesus said, don't tell anybody. But he didn't. And he had a purpose in mind. And we're told exactly why. 
right here. So what does he tell him to do? Go your way and show yourself to the priest to offer for your cleansing those things which Moses commanded. There are two chapters in Leviticus. I'm sure you guys have this right at the top of mind. Two chapters in Leviticus about what a, somebody who has leprosy and they're cleansed of leprosy, what they're supposed to do. There's a sacrifice that's made. There's an examination. They shave all your hair off. They put you aside for eight days. They take you a look. And you have to go to a priest, not a doctor. Don't you find that interesting? You have to go to the priest to be examined. And then when finally they see that you're clean, they bring you publicly before everyone and proclaim you clean. And there's a sacrifice. There are two, two doves. One gets sacrificed, one doesn't. And there's a thing of water and you mix it with blood and you pour it on the live animal and the other animal gets to go free. There's a whole thing. But never in the history of Israel has anyone been cleansed of leprosy who's been a Jew? So all of Leviticus 13 and 14 are there for Jesus' arrival. And he says, go show yourself to the priest and give the sacrifices that are in accordance with the, the writings of Moses. So what's he doing? He's sending a missionary to the high priest. Hey, I had, you remember me. I don't think I do. Yeah, you remember me. I had leprosy. Remember? You were there and my, my last finger fell off. <laughs> oh my goodness, that's what happened. This Jesus guy healed me. He can, you're kidding me. And I'm here to make the sacrifices. I, I got the birds. Can you imagine? Somebody that you knew coming to you to be declared clean. Well, let's... Let's, let's get the buzzer out and, you know, shaving them up and going through all of the things. Jesus, huh? Jesus did this. So what did you have to pay him or what? Nothing. I just said, if you're willing, he says, I'm willing. And he healed me and he touched me. He touched my leprous body. So he makes the sacrifice in keeping and he sends this servant to be a witness and I can imagine meeting all these guys. It's like, wait a minute. I don't remember. What are we supposed to do? That's a part of Leviticus I didn't memorize because we've never needed it. Yeah. You know? It's like, what do you do if you get polio? Well, I don't know. We don't have polio anymore. We just have the vaccine that made it go away. So, you know, I've got to open the books and figure it out. So they'd have to crack open the books and look at Leviticus. It says that the day of your cleansing, that you're to go show yourself to the high priest. That's, that's how the chapter begins. But unfortunately, like the Beatles, stardom ruined the servant. Jesus wasn't able to go into the cities anymore because people would just swamp him and he wasn't able to go there. Can you imagine being a famous person like the Beatles and just being sought after and, you know, girls going, oh, you know, and doing crazy things? <laughs> I mean, you've seen, you've seen the, the, the clips, right? You may have lived through it. Can you imagine being somebody that's that sought after and that popular? You, you can't go anywhere. You, you can't go to the store. You know, you can't go get a burger. You can't go to the diner. You can't go anywhere. Where are you going to go? And people are going to flock around you, and you're not going to be able to do the things that maybe God's called you to do. And that's one of the things that destroys, like, child actors and people that are involved in entertainment. They get so well-known, they don't know who their friends are anymore because everybody treats them overly nice and you don't know what their motives are. Everybody wants to get in your pocket and wants to get money out of you. Everybody wants to use you. People name drop your name. All that kind of bananas. And that, that'll ruin you. That'll just ruin everything. Jesus said, don't ruin everything. Don't tell anybody. But he told everybody. He tells us we should tell everybody and we're not really out there doing it like we should. So that is chapter one of Mark. Next week, we're going to go into chapter two. We've seen Jesus portrayed as a servant and everything that he did. We're going to see next week that he's more than just a servant, but he's God. And he grants forgiveness to people for sin Amen. in accordance with healing and working. So we're going to look at Jesus as a servant and all of the other things that he does. I'm going to welcome the worship team to come up and take their places. I'd like to encourage you guys to take Jesus home with you today. 
that you might remember the things that maybe the Lord's spoken to your heart through his word today, and that you might put those things into practice, because there's always a blessing in doing that which God has called us to do. Amen?